Well, good morning. How are you today? Good to see you. If you're joining us online, welcome. We're so glad that you're here joining us as we uh, finish up a series that's really a mini-series that started last week and then today. It's called Uncommon Generosity. It's uncommon because to walk out what God wants us to do, as we see in Scripture, in the Bible, it is, it's uncommon. There's a culture that, that we live in that operates one way, and God wants us to really be counterculture. And we see that, uh, for example, with Jesus. He says, uh, this is not in the Gospels, but we're told in the book of Acts, this is what Jesus said. Early disciples heard him say this. said, remember the words of the Lord Jesus himself. There is more happiness in giving than receiving. That's counterculture. I mean, because our culture says happiness comes when we get things, right? When we buy things. And, uh, and, and there's some happiness that comes, but it's short-lived. Jesus is saying, hey, there's, it's not that there's not happiness when we buy stuff, but there's more happiness. The other translation says it's, it's blessed. There's something that happens that transpires in our, in our life when we learn how to be uh, givers, when we're more generous. In fact, the Bible really, if you look at key words of the Bible and compare them, you see the Bible is a book about giving. Let me give you an example. The word believe or believing or believer is used 272 times in the Bible, that, that form of that word believe. Prayer or praying or uh, pray is used 371 times. That's an important concept, right? You have believe and pray. And prayer, love, the word love, love, lover, or loving is used 714 times, so quite a bit more. But the word giving or give is used 2,162 times. So it's not just like an afterthought. It is a central a theme of the Bible that giving is part of that. And the reason is because God loves us. And you can give without loving, but you can't love without giving. It's part and parcel. Part of what it means to love is to be, uh, is to give. And we see that in the Bible. So when, when we're giving, it's really important that we have a good attitude towards giving. Some of the benefits uh, that, that come from giving we see in Scripture. I'm just going to go over them real quickly, seven of them, uh, and, then we'll, and then we'll wrap it up with four, four ways that we can get more out of of when we do give. Number one is, is it makes me more like God. Uh, because God, like I said, is a giver. We see that in one of the more famous verses in the Bible. Uh, John 3.16 says, God so loved the world that he gave. Giving. Giving is an important, that's an expression of love. And we see that. And so whenever we give, we're more like God. Now, the, honestly, uh, when the Spirit of Christ comes into somebody, when we ask Jesus into our life, the Bible says that the Spirit of God indwells us, that He comes inside us, empowers us, starts to renew us. But the, here's what, what, um, what the Bible says, is that God is a giver, and so if His Spirit is in us, it means we're givers. That's who we are. It's not like when I, when I talk about giving, it's not like I'm standing up here and, you know, we're all a bunch of selfish people and I'm trying to convince you to not be selfish anymore. No, if, if you're a Christ follower, your nature, your new nature in Christ is to be a giver. And so that's, that's certainly the way I, I see it. Now, sometimes we, we have blockages, you know, like we're in debt or we have other things going on. We want to give, but we feel like we can't. That's a different, different issue. But inside us, we're, if we have the Spirit of Christ in us, we're givers. Now, it, it does help to be intentional. It does for me. I want to be, I want to help, help that part of what Christ is doing in my life to come out. One of the ways I do it is uh, I, I, I uh, have this daily planner I use. Some of you might use planners. Uh, the planner I use, and it, I'm, not, I'm not saying you need to use it. I, I don't get kickbacks. I'm not trying to promote it or anything. But the one I use is called the Full Focus Planner. Michael Hyatt wrote and I like it a lot. It helps me organize. It has annual goals and ties it into, uh, you know, objectives and then ultimately daily things that you do to kind of lead, lead to uh, be more effective and more efficient. 
But at the top, so I have this daily planner, and the way he designed it is at the top, you have three things that you're going to do for sure. So, you know, if, if for me, I just have, like, sometimes a list so big that I go to bed and I think, man, I didn't get anything. I, it, feels like, it feels a little defeating, like, oh, I didn't accomplish what I could have. And I, so what, the way he designed it is, is if nothing else, you get these three things done, then at the end of the day, you think, hey, at least I accomplished those. Those are the most important three things. So you kind of like each day, you look at your day and you go, okay, if nothing else, I want to accomplish three, three, th these three things. For me, I have three categories. One is, is I, want, I want to do something each day that's creative. I want to do something each day that helps me accomplish, move towards my goal. I have annual goals, and I want to do something that's, that moves the, the ball down the field a little bit. And then, and then I want to do something generous. And, and because if it's not on my radar, I can go through a whole day, and I look back, and I think, did I, did I do anything generous today? And I don't want that answer to be no. I want to, so I put it, each day I think it through. How I'm looking for an opportunity to be generous to be creative and then, you know, to reach my goals. So I, the, generosity is, helps us to, to, to be more like God. It also helps us to, to become closer to God. Sometimes we don't feel that close to God. Well, one, you can actually change that. If you don't feel close to God, you, Jesus says the key is, is to make sure you align your life with God through your treasures, what's, what's important to you. For where your treasure is, Jesus said, there your heart will be also. And we know that's true. I mean, wherever your treasure, some people, it's, their treasure is in their boat. It could be in your business, your career. It could be in your family. It could be in your home. It, I mean, whatever, wherever you invest your time, your money, your energy, that's where your heart is. And so when we give to advance the kingdom of God and help, you know, further the, the gospel, our heart, every time we give towards that, our heart is aligned closer to God in that way. Number three, giving is victory over materialism. Now we live in, in a materialistic culture. It comes from just being uh, the wealthiest country in the, in the world. Uh, you know, we're in the first, as they call, first world problems. And, and there's constant messages coming our way saying that, uh, that, you know, your happiness is connected to how much you have. And if you get this, you'll be happier. If you get this, and that's, that's really materialism. And there's a lot of messages that come from that, and we can get sucked into that. And the antidote, really, is every time we give, we, we, we break the back of materialism that tries to get a hold of us. It says, command those who are rich, that's everybody in our country compared to the rest of the world, in this present world, not to put your hope in wealth, but to put your hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. God says, I want you to enjoy what you have, but we don't put our hope there. Command them to be generous and willing to share. It's real easy to just live always thinking that our hope, our security comes from how much we have. But the truth is there's always a crisis, a catastrophe that's bigger than your pile. No matter how much you've set aside, there's a catastrophe that can wipe it out. And so if, you're, if you tied your hope to that, there's an insecurity that's at root in your life. So we need, as Christ followers, we realize, hey, God is bigger. He's going to be my hope. He's going to see me through uh, the tough times. And I'm not going to get caught up in the materialism uh, that's all around me. I read this book a number of years ago called Enough is Enough. John Taylor wrote it, and he talks about how there's all these, these myths or lies, you know, that are promoted through TV, you know, and he says as a family, he, he recommends that we just take a stand against that. He, he, here's, here's a quote from the book. He says, every Christian family ought to adapt as, adopt as their slogan when TV commercials come on. And Who are you kidding? Because there's a message with it. If you buy and use our toothpaste, you'll be sexy. You just... <laughs> Who are you kidding? You know, if you use our deodorant, you'll be successful. Who are you kidding? If you drink our beer, you'll have all these friends. Who are you kidding? I'm not sure I want those kinds of friends, right? That, you know, oh, you have the wrong beer. You know, have you seen some of the commercials? You know, if you bring the wrong beer to the party, you're like ousted. What's up with that? So it, you just, who are we kidding? I'm not, in fact, every time we give, 
it helps us direct ourselves th- what's important and who is our source. That's the purpose of tithing, the Bible says. The purpose of tithing is to teach you to always put God first in your lives. It's a way to anchor our hope in God. God is the one who is going gonna, is gonna to be there for me. And number four, giving strengthens my faith. Truth is, God doesn't need our money, right? I mean, I think we know that. God doesn't need our money. He can, he's doing fine without us. He wants what it represents. And, and God is interested in developing disciples, raising disciples, not dollars. And so it, it strengthens our faith. In fact, it's, there's an interesting Bible verse. It's in the last book of the Old Testament that God says, this is a way that you can actually test that God will come through. It's a way of proving God exists. It says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me, God says, test me in this. And see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. So an incredible promise, this floodgates of heaven, God's going to do it. And he says it's, it, it's all about testing God that we, you know, that we give, this, this idea of tithing. Sometimes people say, oh, well, you know, I, I would love to give, but I don't have any. So if God gives me first, then he'll get some back. But that's not operating in faith that doesn't strengthen our faith it's it's when we give then god then it comes back you know i highlighted this word floodgates because i was preparing this message this week now i've i've taught on this and have read this personally for many many years and i i always thought i knew what floodgates was and i thought you know i'm I'm not sure i really know so i looked it up and it really means the last restraint holding back an outpouring of something powerful that's what it means I thought, well, that's, that's significant because sometimes we're trying to do, you know, well, I'm going to church and I'm praying and, you know, I'm trying to be kind to people and, be, you know, be nice to my employees that, you know, or the, my, my people at work. And we, we, but why isn't God blessing me? He, you know what? The floodgates, it's the last restraint holding back an outpouring of something powerful. For some of you, this is what's holding back the floodgates in your life. You just need to trust God. You need to trust God with your, with your finances and say, God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to trust you and see what happens and hold you to your promise. And watch if God doesn't come through for you. Number five, giving is an investment in eternity. And so there is, we're giving. When we give, we want to be thinking eternally. In other words, I'm giving. And how do you, how do you give eternally? Well, you give and, and you invest in people that are going there. When people come up to you in heaven, you, you have people come up to you and you won't even know them. They'll go, thank you. I'm here because of you. It's because we gave, you know, to change people's eternities. And the truth is what we have here on earth ends here on earth. I mean, when we, when I've, I've done, I've been in ministry for a lot of years and, and I've done a number of funerals. I've never once seen a, a, a hearse you know, pulling a U-Haul. Oh, well, this is all the stuff that goes with him. No. He, you know, there's that saying, that saying, he who dies with the most toys wins. No, you win nothing. If you, if you, if you just make your, your treasure, your home here on earth, we are thinking heavenward. We're thinking, hey, I want to give for something bigger than that, something that outlasts me. Give happily to those in need. Always be ready to share whatever God has given you. He's talking about generosity, right? He says, by doing this, you will be storing up real treasure. Real, so there's, evidently there's, there's treasure that's not as real, but real treasure for yourselves in heaven. That's what he's talking about. He says, as a Christ follower, we want to be strategic. Hey, how can I have treasure that's awaiting me? It is the only safe investment for eternity. So all of the investments here, there's some secure ones, but the ones that are safest and have the greatest multiple of ROI, what I like to call EROI, instead of just results on investment, it's eternal results on investment, is when we give with the idea of eternity in mind, eternity. Then number six, giving blesses me in return. Now this is true. This is a, I mean, a farmer knows that. When I sow, I'm going to get back. If I sow more seed, I'll get more back. If I sow less seed, I'll get less back. And 
the, in 2 Corinthians 9, Paul talks about that exact analogy. He goes, when we give, it's just like when a farmer sows seed. But it's not just finances. It's, it's when you sow uh, encouragement in people's lives, you get back encouragement. You sow criticism, what are you going to get back? You're going to get criticism. You sow gossip, you're going to get that back. It's just a, it's just a, a law of life. I, I saw this happen this past week. Sharon and I were in Arizona in Phoenix at a conference, and we went out to dinner one night at an Italian restaurant, just her and I. And we're, we're sitting there at this table, and this, this young server is, you know, she's, uh, she's somewhat new because she was making a fair amount of mistakes. But everybody's got to learn, right? But she had a great attitude, and, you know, it's, it was, she was working. She was trying real hard. So the manager, her manager happens to be walking by at one point, and I stop him right when she's there. And I said, hey, I just want you to know this. And I, I don't remember her name now, but I, met, I called her by name. I said, you know, this servant, she's doing a great job. She's got a terrific attitude. It's great having, you want to keep her around. And, you know, just kind of praised her in front of her. And so, of course, she's beaming. And then he goes, thanks. And he walks off. And, and so and at the end of the meal, you know, when I'm, she gives us our check and she, and she shows up with this box of, and it turns out it's filled with cookies. And right next to the store, as part of the restaurant, there was a store next to it that sold like gelato and Italian cookies. And she goes, I went and got all my very favorite cookies and assembled them. I'm, you're not being charged anything. I just want to give them to you. Now, I didn't do it for the cookies. So, <laughs> I didn't, I didn't, there wasn't no ulterior motive. But it's, that's how it works, right? You sow encouragement, you get, it just comes back. And that's a law of life. It's true. The Bible says good will come to those who are generous. You're generous with your compliments. You're generous with your encouragement. You're generous with your forgiveness. You're generous with your grace. What are you going to get back? And it's always nice to get those kinds of things back. You're going, to get be- you're going to get that back. A generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. You have to decide, what do you want to even be remembered for? When, you, when your life is over, do you want people to think of, you know, when they think of you, you know, do they want to think, oh, that person was generous. That person was so kind. That person was patient with me. You know, Calvin Cooley said, no man is ever honored for what he received in life, he's only honored for what he gave. There's plenty of people that amass fortunes. But you, I mean, you make a living by what you earn, but you make a life by what you give, how you're generous. And that is one of the principles of, of being generous. And then lastly, giving makes me happy. Giving really makes me happy. Sometimes people say, yeah, you give till it hurts. No, that's, it doesn't hurt to give. And if you've given, you know. You know that, I mean, there's a, there's a physiological part of it. Dopamine is re- released by the hypothalamus in the brain. Every time you give, they've, they've you know, done brain scans. There's always a release of this dopamine. So it certainly makes you feel good at that level, but there's even something. You're, there's a congruency that happens as a Christ follower. You're being true to who this new nature that, is, that God is at work in your body, in your life. And the happiest people really are people that have learned this about giving. Interesting, there's a guy who has passed away uh, about, uh, I guess, two decades now, Carl Manager. He was a, an American uh, psych- psychiatrist and had a great influence on the, air, on, the, on the field of mental health. He had a, the, the manager clinic and had wrote a number of books and really spoke into that field of mental health. Here's what he says about generosity, something very interesting. He says, giving is a good criterion of mental health. Generous people are rarely mentally ill. Isn't that interesting? Now, the world would say the opposite, right? You know, you've got problems. You know, you don't know what you're doing. But the truth is, you know, when we learn how to be generous, there, that helps us anchor ourselves emotionally and mentally. The tr- and, and in our church, when we, when we do uh, growth track and, we, and, and Sharon and I teach step one, I always like to open up each, each, um, each meeting that we have. I'll say, hey, what do you like best about the church? You know, what's your one-minute version of what you like best? And over and over, I'll hear, this church, they're so friendly. 
They're so happy. They're so joyful. But let me tell you, if you're new to the church, let me tell you why that's true. It's because our people know how to be generous. And they've dialed that in, and that makes you joyful. It says, The people rejoiced at the willing response of their leaders, for they had given freely and wholeheartedly to the Lord. David the king also rejoiced greatly. And so we see the people of God. And that day, they were... they dialed into this area of joy and being rejo- you know, rejoicing because they learned how to give and be open-handed. Well, those are the seven things I told you I'd go through them quickly of, of the benefits of being generous. But you can still miss out. You can t- how do you keep from missing out on when, it's, when it's an opportunity to give so that you, 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 get, you, know, you get the maximum benefit? Well, let's look at that real briefly. Number, four things. Number one, is being willing to give. You know, having that uh, in your life, you know, I, I'm willing. It's not a have to, it's I get to. And I get to because it's an expression of me recognizing the source. It all came from God anyways. Amen. Sometimes we think, well, you know, I work hard. Yeah, but who gave you your strength? Who gave you, you know, the, the, the life? You know, well, I work, I, you know, I educated myself. Who gave you your brain? You know, just recognizing, hey, it comes from God. Here's what uh, we see in 1 Chronicles. He says, who am I that I should presume to be giving something to you? Talking to God. You know, I'm supposed to be giving to you. He goes, everything comes from you anyways. All we're doing is giving back what we've already been given from your generous hand. It all came from you. It was all yours in the first place. That's the willingness. Hey, I'm going to, why would I not? God, it, you're my source. You're, the, you're my provider. Obviously, I want to be able to respond and give. I know you want us, our true selves, and so I've given from the heart, honestly and happily, and now see all these people doing the same thing, giving freely, willingly, and joyfully. So it's a matter of willingness, not wealth. Often we think, well, you know, it's, it's how much. No, no. It's attitude, not amount. It's attitude. It's willingness, not wealth. And when it comes to giving... Really, there's two ways to give. One is through reason. One is through revelation. Reason is just, well, what can I afford? You know, you know, how, you know, and you just kind of think it, think about it. You pull out, you know, your budget or whatever. The other one is giving by revelation, and you go, God, how much do you want me to give? And that builds in a relationship with God. It builds trust. It strengthens your faith, and that's what we always encourage you to do. Whenever we talk about giving, we say this is between you and God. And go home and pray about it. You should, the Bible says you shouldn't give, give under compulsion anyways. You see a heart-wrenching commercial, some, you know, some, some person in some third world country with flies all over them, and they're, they're trying to pull your heartstrings. The Bible says you shouldn't give. I'm not, not that you shouldn't give to that, but you shouldn't give out of compulsion or guilt. If they're just trying to make you feel guilty. Or, 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 and, you know, and unfortunately, people are motivated to, by, by guilt and give to God out of guilt. I was praying this morning and I felt like God was saying, some of you, and this might be a word for, for, for you, some of you give and you always feel guilty when you give. You know, for maybe you feel like you're not giving enough or maybe you feel like, you know, uh, you know God doesn't love you enough or wh- whatever it is. But God, listen, that is not the heart of, of God. When we give, we give freely, we give joyfully, you don't need to have guilt attached to that at all. And God wants to deliver you from that. But really, when we give out of revelation, it's God, we're just obeying. God, how much do, how, how do I respond? What do I give? And our whole life really should be lived like that anyways. So we give willingly. We give generously. We give generously. Jesus talks about what generosity looks like and how that and how God uses that to bless us. When we're generous, God uses our generosity as a vehicle to bless us. Here's, here's what Jesus said. He said, give generously and generous gifts will be given back to you. So there's that promise, that law of the farm. You know, what you sow comes back. He says that. He says, shaking that. But he says it actually increases. And it's true, right? A farmer that plants one seed, does he get one plant? No, he gets, you're right, he gets a, a bumper crop just from, just from one seed. And it's always like that. He goes, it's shaken together to make room for more. Abundant gifts will pour out upon you with such an overflowing measure that it will run over the top. That's an incredible promise. But then he adds this. The measurement of your generosity becomes the measurement 
of your return. So God uses the measurement we use. And so if we're generous with whatever measurement we use is what he uses to bless us back. If we want to increase how God's going to bless us, Jesus says, well, that's simple. Increase your generosity. Increase your measurement. I'm not saying that. And it, 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 God's saying that. And that's true. Uh, for me, that's something we grow in, right? It's we learn to trust God. We, you, we, we're generous and we start to see how God uses that to bless us back. And then give joyfully. Now, if you can't give joyfully, then don't give. I mean, honestly, it should be we get to. We get to do. God calls us into the party, calls us into the game. We get to participate and we get to see people. Every time somebody gets baptized, that's from your gift. You, you should be thinking. That's certainly what I do. When I give, I'm thinking I get to help people break free from addictions. I get to help people uh, re- get restored in their relationships, marriages restored, uh, kids that are, uh, you know, that are from broken homes. God starts to work in their lives and heal and restore them. People s- discovering their purpose in life, people making a difference with their life, people changing their eternities. There's a lot of reasons to be joyful when we give. Amen. One of the things we do here at Vineyard, and we've really done it, since the beginning, Sharon and I started this church 27 years ago. And from day one, we had a benevolence or a compassion ministry, helping people out, people in disadvantaged places in their lives. And a lot of times it's, it's, it's for a season. You know, they lose their job. Something, COVID, of course, happened recently. And, and they're, they're in a difficult place. And when we're able to help them in that place, uh, it touches the heart of God, but it also touches their heart. We're able to really reach in in that moment of pain, that moment of, of instability and challenge, and to love on them, and to, in moments, to share the love of Christ with them. And, and so our food pantry is spearheads uh, some of that. We have a number of ministries that we, help, that we help people in our community. But this past week, Sharon got up with our, the person who oversees our, uh, our, our food pantry, Teresa Hart, and she just asked her a couple questions about, uh, about the food pantry and some of the ministry that happens there. And I wanted you to hear this, so we went ahead and grabbed our videographer, and I want you to watch this video and see. This is some of why we give. Well, hi there. I'm Pastor Sharon Mead, Senior Co-Founding Pastor of the Vineyard Community Church. And I'm Teresa Hart, uh, the food pantry manager. Previously, Clients came into the pantry, uh, ask them what kind of food they like, put it in the bags, carry it out. We had to totally change it. Some of them are truly living by themselves and not talking to anybody. They yeah. need more. They, they need, need more than mm-hmm. food. Th- th- these people need love. They need, it touched my heart. I just felt like we need, we need to change. So we did, we changed the whole process okay. out here. I mean, I felt like I got in a rut as far as the pantry yeah. and then COVID, it was like a challenge. Opening of the parking lot, greeting them, talking to them for a few minutes, giving them bumper stickers or whatever we might have on hand. I started reading some documents from the food bank and it was, what can we do to help you? What can we, to serve more people? I'm gonna fill this out and Mm -hmm. see what I can. See what happens. See what Mm -hmm. what I can do. Well, so I asked for freezers, I asked for meat, I asked for food, I asked for, you know, anything I could think of. I wish I'd thought a little longer, but anyway, <laughs> we got the freezers, and aren't they gorgeous? They are beautiful. I was so excited. I was so excited. But then he blessed us even more. A couple weeks later, I get a call, and they want to know, hey, would you like to be part of the Food Lion Project? Just give us a list of what, you, what kind of food you need and quantity. And I said, to last us how long? So I put enough food on there to basically last us a year. Sure. Mm -hmm. They called and said, okay, we'll have that food ready in two weeks or whatever it was. I panicked. Yeah. We don't have enough room for all this food. Not only that, we, these freezers wouldn't even hold all the meat. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I was able to get in touch with the the food lion manager. She said, you know, we can hold the meat in Mm -hmm. our walk-in. So that wasn't an issue that we wouldn't be able to turn this food over mm-hmm. that quick. So yeah. I thought, you know what, we need to share it. 
yep. he, God blessed us, we're going to bless them. So I started going to the churches in, in the area and giving them our cards, and they gave it to their pantry clients. And somehow they started talking about snow globes. Well, they realized they had a snow globe in their car. Well, they went and got, and you saw the tears. Yeah. I mean, Kim, her name is Kim, and she was just, yes. But you know what? That means that we touched her. You, you sure know, did. We touched her. Yeah. Somebody saw her. Same thing. Uh, there was another lady who lost her mother. Her mother and her used to come to pantry every month. Yeah. Well, they didn't come one month. And it was unusual, so I called her. Yeah. And she said, Teresa, she said, I'm sick. She said, I've got COVID, and my mother lives in the house with me, and I'm so concerned that she's going to get it. Yeah. And uh, so the following month, neither one came. Okay? Yeah. So I called again. The mother had passed. The mother had passed. And you know, the following month, Deborah came, and she said, I don't need any food. Yeah. But I, I, I knew that y'all would make me happy if I drove through this parking lot. I know. That's what our that's what our outreach is about. Sure. It, it's it's about people and the Lord and love. Sure. And it's reaching people. Mm -hmm. Isn't that great? I love it. You know, when we give, you don't always see those things. That's why I wanted you to see a little bit about how your giving, your generosity is impacting the lives of people around. And there's, there's reason to be joyful about that. The Bible says, let giving flow from your heart, not from a sense of religious duty. Let it spring up freely from the joy of giving, all because God loves hilarious generosity. You don't hear that very often, hilarious generosity. But this, this is from the Passion Translation, but it's actually accurate because the Greek word that it's pulling from is hilarion. It's where we get our word hilarious. And so we give, we give with a joy in our, in, in our heart because we know we're making a huge impact. You know, back in the day, 500 years ago, when the Protestant Reformation happened with Martin Luther, the main reason he, was, he, was, he didn't agree with the Catholic Church at the time was they're raise, they're, they were raising, indul, you know, selling indulgences. That's how they were raising money. And so he called on said, hey, that's, we, we need to give and give for the right reasons. Here's what he said. Every Christian needs two conversions, one for the soul and the other for the pocketbook. You know, giving for the right reasons. Giving because we want to make a difference. Giving joyfully. Giving willfully. These are the giving generously. These are the things that if we're going to be like, be like God, if we're going to draw near to God, if we're going to have those attributes, then we give and we give for that reason. The truth is the people next to you, a number of, of people in our church have come to Christ in this church. And people next to you, you may not even know them, but they are here because of you. They are here because of you. You're making a difference. And that leads me to my last point, which is giving eternally. I mentioned that earlier about giving for eternity, seeing the bigger picture. This is important because it's part of the way that uh, God rewards us. We get some of those rewards here, but you know there's rewards yet to come as well if we give for the right, for the right reason. Uh, when I was in high school, I, was, I ran track, and I was trying to run faster than a six-minute mile. I could do about a six-minute mile. And you know, that's a, if you run, you know, that's a, that's a decent clip. And so my, I told my dad, and, and he goes, well, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll help you. So we were kind of training a little bit. And the track I was running on at the time was, you actually had to go eight times around to do a mile. I know they don't do the mile anymore, but that's my age, right? You know, so, but anyways, um, uh, so he would call out. He would stand there, and every time I'd come by, he would call out a time. But it wasn't the, the, the current time. It was the time he would do the math in his head. And he said, if you, basically, if, if I kept that pace, this is the time I would reach. So he'd say like six minute, 10, you know, 10 seconds, six minute flat, five minute, 50 seconds. And so I could know, what, do I need to speed up? Do I not? I kind of feel like I'm your coach in that sense, you know, because you're running, all of us, we're running a race and there'll be an end to the race. There'll be an end to the race. And I want you to do well. So I, from time to time, I call out and kind of tell you, you know, your pace. How are you doing? Ultimately, it's between you and God, right? You have to, 
gifted. But I'm, I'm bringing this subject up. We're doing a Bible study, looking at it, so you can honestly ask yourself, am I running the race that I really want to run? Because when we give and to, because there's a lot of things to give to. There's a lot of great causes. But not everything reaps a reward. Here's how the Bible puts it. First Corinthians, it says, and the quality of each person's work will be seen when the day of Christ exposes it. For most of us, that's the day we die. You know, there will be a day when, 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 all, when we see it for really what it is. For on that day, fire will reveal everyone's work. The fire will test it and show its real quality. If what was built on the foundation survives the fire, the building will receive, the builder will receive a reward. And so there's a lot of good things to do, a lot of kind things. And I'm not saying don't do it. Just let's be aware not everything is going to get a reward. The way we get a reward is when we give for eternal purposes. We give for eternal when, we, when we're going to make a difference for eternity. And so we want to be thoughtful of that so that when that day comes, we're not like disappointed. Because the Bible actually just has, says that there's two judgments. One for, you know, people that have put their faith in Christ and people that have not. That's not what this is talking about. There's another one for those who are going to heaven, but there's another one that decides, do you get rewards or not, and how many? And it all has to do with the work. Did it pass the fire? Did, did it make, was it just, you know, a temporary, help something out temporary, or did it, did it impact eternity? Last verse, Jesus, you know, the last thing he said is recorded in Revelation. Last thing he said, here's what he said. He says, look, I'm coming soon. My reward is with me. So he's bringing with him rewards, and I will give to each person according to what they have done. So we each need to know that, that there is a reward that's attached to the end of this life. And that's part of the reason we give. We give joyfully. We give expectantly. We give knowing that when we give to make a difference for eternity, that there's rewards that are awaiting for us. That's why it's not an obligation. It's an opportunity. And we give, we get to give. And it's an opportunity to give joyfully. Okay, let's bow our heads and pray. Now, Lord, I... I know that this area of generosity obviously impacts financially, but it's, we want to be generous people. Some of you, this is an area that you need to grow in, regardless of whether you give financially generously. Maybe there's an area where you're not generous with your words, with encouragement. Maybe you're not generous with forgiveness. We all want forgiveness, but it's harder to be generous with forgiveness and giving people grace and looking past mistakes instead of harboring on them. Whatever the Holy Spirit's, because I, we talk about this a lot here. We say, just you pray about it. Do what God's telling you to do. God may be working on you in a different area, and I'm thankful for that. Just listen to what the Holy Spirit says. Do what God's telling you to do. That's where we derive our strength and our courage. So you just ask that question. God, how can I be more generous? How can I trust you? How can I test you? Where am I putting my hope? Some of you, you don't feel close to God. You might even be a Christ follower. You might be a Christian, but you're saying, I don't feel close to God. Part of the way that we draw near to God is making sure we realign our lives, coming home to God, putting our treasures there. But your first step is always begins with prayer. Asking Christ, say, God, forgive me. Renew my life. Give me a fresh start. For some of you, you need to take that step right now. That is the step that you're supposed to take. 
and you go and you just pray this prayer just in your mind you can do that right now say God that's me I need you in my life honestly you just say God forgive me for areas I don't trust you teach me how to walk and follow you some of you need God's joy you say God help me to remember the end goal in life regardless of whether people recognize the generosity that I give them I'm doing it for your reward you say God I want to put my hope in you thank you in Jesus name amen Amen. Awesome. Well, uh, for those of you who, who sit, you know, made a, a faith commitment right now, I want to be able to pray for you and let you know uh, your next steps. You can let us know you, uh, any prayer requests you have. If you prayed with me on the Connect card, you can write on there, Andy, I prayed with you. Put it in the clear box on their way out. Um, if you're online, there's a way for you to do that as well. Uh, so uh, our, our hope and our prayer for you is that you know, God's going to do some amazing things in your life to unleash the capacity to be even more and more generous. One of the ways that you can uh, support the vineyard, uh, the work that we're doing here, is financially. And we uh, so provided some ways for you to do that. You can text 45777 and then VCC in the amount. Uh, you can go on our website. We have Quick Give, another easy way to give. And we'd love to have your support. If this is your church home, we'd love to uh, join with you in that. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and sing a final song. Would you stand with me? I'll go ahead and close in prayer. Then we'll sing. Father, we thank you, Lord, for our opportunity to just express our love to you through giving, through generosity. Lord, help us to embrace all that you're doing in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.